So 2020 was a bad time. There were barely any movies out last year, so we didn't get to experience many movie moments. You know movie moments? Moments where you collectively experience something brand new in an excited theater. Moments you talk about in the bar with your friends. Images that stick in your head for weeks afterwards. But there was one for me. One movie moment. Okay, the first time I watched Tenet, I was really annoyed. The second time, I was riveted. Now I know a lot of people didn't connect with this movie. They stayed in that annoyed phase that I was. And I completely understand that. But I got so much out of it in repeat viewings. And I'm only like 38% stupid. So I got really obsessed and I started thinking about what is this movie and why is it was so frustrating for so many people. My sibling just made a video essay on objectivity and the idea of bad art that kind of explains this. When people say something is bad, what do they mean? Generally, it means they want of the art to fulfill some purpose or value, and it just didn't. A large portion of the audience was really disappointed that the film didn't have clearer emotional stakes. Others thought it was just indulgent pseudoscience techno babble that was deliberately confusing to seem smart. Others because they couldn't hear any of the goddamn dialogue over the cyberpunk rape music. And I can totally see that. It doesn't hit as hard as Inception emotionally. But what if the movie was trying to just do something else? Tenet is not gunning for your emotions. It doesn't expect you to understand what's going on in the first viewing. Like a lot of sci-fi movies, Tenet is is designed to be watched multiple times, and as you become familiar with the structure, it starts to make a lot of sense. Some parts of the movie are easy to digest on the first watch, but some are inscrutable, asking you to figure them out. The first time I watched the interrogation scene, I was like, what the fuck is going on? It's deliberately packaged as disassembled pieces of a puzzle that you have to figure out. See, the first time I watched it, I was expecting, you know, a fairly normal movie, and I was disappointed. The second time I watched it, I played along with the game, and that's what this film is. It's a brain teaser game. That's the entertainment it's trying to provide. I'm not saying it's intellectual high class art and you, you, you don't get it because you're an uncultured swine. It's just a different kind of fun. One that happens specifically in your rewatch or while you're doing dishes and running through the mind bending timeline like wait if he was over there at that time then he would be over there. Huh. Wow. I guess that was wow. See it's a different kind of fun than Inception which is a different kind of fun from a Marvel movie which is a different kind of fun from a romantic comedy. We're supposed to engage with things in different ways and Tenet has been so so fun for me. I love love playing the game of Tenet, and now I'm gonna try and share that fun with you. <clears throat> so Christopher Nolan, this guy seems to have this new attitude of what can I get away with? See, he's one of the few directors alive today who can make original films that make money. He's hyper fixated on time and he keeps hitting us with new perspectives on it. Making film student essays extremely easy to write now. But I think we can all agree that this one is different. Tenet is trying something new. The problem with experimentation in film is by definition, you're going against the language of cinema. It's going to betray some of the audience's common sensibilities. So when Nolan decides to try and make a movie with a different goal than traditional entertainment and not go going for some kind of emotional catharsis, it's naturally going to ask a little more of you as an audience. Is that to say Tenet is not indulgent? <laughs> of course not, it is. It has this structure that seems like it's not for us. But when you allow Tenet to indulge itself, and when you indulge with it on its terms, there is a really great movie experience here for you. A different one. A, more of a thought experiment. A riddle. A science fiction Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> so what are its terms? What are the rules to the game? What is Tenet really about? Okay, Tenet isn't about saving the world. It's not about protecting protagonist overcoming obstacles and completing any character arcs. It's not even about inverted bullets. No. Tenet is entirely about the temporal pincer maneuver. Okay, if you haven't seen the film, you're gonna be completely lost. What would it look like if a faction of people had the ability to move forward and backwards through time simultaneously? But the time travel rules are under a fixed timeline. Nothing changes. If you decide to go back in time to accomplish some sort of goal, necessarily, you've already done it. It's in the past, but also in your lived experience, it's coming up in your future. So under these rules, if a faction was using this ability to time travel, why would they use it? and how would it work? This fundamentally seems to be what the movie is about. See, we're introduced to inversion as being you can invert objects to go back in time, but really it's about inverting people. Because in the future, a scientist invents a bomb that can destroy time or reverse it. We don't actually know. The future people really want to use it so they can reverse the damage that has been done to Earth due to climate change. And they hate the past for it, and the past really doesn't want to do it because they think it's going to end all of time, so they're fighting each other. So we take this tool of inversion and we have two fighting parties using inversion to gain control of the algorithm. This means sending people, weapons, money, and messages backwards and forwards through time to accomplish their goals. Uh, is 
Oh, this is so fucked. I'm having a lot of fun just trying to explain it. So what does this temporal war even look like? How does this work? When we're in a fixed timeline, but human beings are working from both the future going backwards and the past going forwards to win a war, what absolute sorcery would the battle strategizing consist of? How would one exploit this game-changing power to the best of its ability? The inevitable answer to this is the reason this movie exists. It's the game that Christopher Nolan is playing, the temporal pincer maneuver. Guys, this entire movie is just Christopher Nolan going, the temporal pincer maneuver. Wouldn't that be fucked up? That would be so fucked up. Okay. The Temporal Pincer Maneuver is a paradoxical battle strategy. It consists of two teams, Red Team and Blue Team. Red Team is moving from the past to the future, like normal people. Blue Team is inverted. They are moving backwards from the future through time. For the sake of people who have a hard time wrapping their head around it, like me, I'm gonna explain this first in linear terms. Red Team goes in to fight a battle, like normal. Blue Team, from their perspectives, sits the fight out. Then, after the battle's over, they invert themselves, and they go into the fight with all the knowledge of Red Team's movements and work with them to stage as close to a perfect combat strategy as humanly possible. They go into the battle knowing what's gonna happen so they can help their buddies. But here's the thing, Red Team also knows everything that's gonna happen. They both know. Blue Team, having traveled backwards through time to before the fight takes place, tells Red Team everything that's gonna happen in their fight. So now it's just a complete paradox. Both teams know how it goes. And how it goes is the correct terminology here. Not how it's gone, not how it's gonna go, because this knowledge is now without origin. Where would it have come from? It's unknowable. Theoretically, there's some alternate universe where Red Team went ahead and did the fight on their own to tell Blue Team how it goes. But no one gets to see that because we're in a fixed timeline. Red Team receives information that they created in the future before they know it. This is the temporal pincer maneuver. But it begs the question then, does it even help? Yeah, it probably gives them a massive strategic edge to know everything, but we almost don't even know if that's true anymore. Because there is no speculation as to the outcome of this battle. All the soldiers are simply performing their part in like a pre-written play. This is what's so fucked up to try and wrap your head around the final battle of this movie. We're seeing all of this convoluted paradox stuff happening directly, and it's completely mind-bending. It takes a lot of effort to piece together what the hell we're even looking at. I mean, I just... What what the hell? Now that is crazy. Really cool to look at. Now you might look at this and hate it because you're like, oh, well that doesn't make any sense. The building would have to have been assembled, already broken or something. But the entire film is a temporal paradox. You have to buy into the idea that this would be a paradox and it could work. Doesn't feel like a much bigger leap than a man surviving falling into a black hole because it's actually a tesseract and he can travel through time there. But if that's the whole concept of the movie, what's your solution then? He doesn't make the movie? How about you just sit back and enjoy the concept? Isn't that what sci-fi is all about? But looking at this scene as a whole, what we're looking at here is just a singular battle. What about a long-term strategy? What if you had a temporal pincer maneuver that takes place over a week? What about a temporal pincer maneuver that spans 50 fucking years? What? You see, the ending of Tenet is a temporal pincer maneuver inside of a temporal pincer maneuver inside of a larger temporal pincer maneuver. See, in the larger course of the movie, the protagonist is on the red team and Neil is in the blue team. Neil comes from the future to assist the protagonist, to do something that Neil already knows he succeeds at doing. He's playing a part. Every single person in the tenant organization is performing in like a feedback loop, all to ensure that the algorithm is never activated at any point in history. And the movie itself is structured as a temporal pincer maneuver. It's completely shirking its responsibilities as an action movie meant to deliver on character arcs and emotional punch and super high stakes with a lot of tension. Tenet almost refuses to make sense or generate the tension that we might expect and we might need. It's designed for us to observe the temporal pincer maneuver and watch all of its parts perform and feedback into each other. This film is an intellectual exercise. It's not a plot. It's not a satisfying emotional payoff. It's just a display of an insane paradox for an audience. And at the end of this grand experiment, Travis Scott says, start, start. so don't go into this movie looking for a movie. <laughs> Strap your brain in and enjoy the ride of thought that this movie is taking you on. Watch the film again to try and parse out the timeline in your head. Fill in all the gaps. Realize how they work. Trust me, this shit is really fun to do. Now, if I'm that whole spiel about the end of the movie, why is it that this moment is my favorite in the film? Well, I gotta talk to you about... JDW is fantastic in Tenet. I've read some bullshit about the protagonist not being a very good protagonist, but 
As a fellow actor, I'd like to vouch for what this man brought to this film. A performance is not just dialogue reading. It's how the actor moves, how they sit in their bodies as the character, how their performance is serving the specific vision of the director. Not everyone is supposed to be a Tony Stark quippy emotion machine. Look at Ryan Gosling in Blade Runner. This performance is cold, emotionless, and most of the time kind of dull. But would you argue it's a bad performance? Not at all. Every emotion is beneath the surface. Sometimes it's better not to spell out every emotion for the audience. And John David Washington did something really interesting here. First of all, he's a really exciting casting choice because of the lack of baggage general audiences have with him as an action star. You know how when you watch a Chris Evans movie now, you just can't shake the feeling that it's Captain America doing what he's doing? That's because we have baggage. We have experience with him playing a specific type of character, which can sometimes be a detriment to a performance, which has nothing to do with the performance itself, but the audience's relationship to that actor. But for John David Washington, this is our first real experience with him as the lead of a film like this. He's a fresh-faced protagonist, both to us and to the organization. And as a blank slate, he portrays a character that we don't know much about, but we understand through his decisions and distinct personality. And remember, this isn't a movie about him, it's about the concept. So he doesn't necessarily need to accomplish the same things as another action hero might. When I saw him in his spy movie, scenes, he really impressed me with how suave he could be. Even with Elizabeth Debicki towering over him with her nine-foot goddess energy, he's an absolute anchor. He stands strong and with authority, and he makes a lot of decisions. And he's also really fucking funny. I ordered my hot sauce an hour ago. But the real money from this character is how he performs in his action scenes. The next time you watch this film, notice his ferocity. Watch how he runs. It is beautiful. It's like watching Tom Cruise run, you know? We watch it for the performance of action, the performance of body. I get so much adrenaline from watching him run as fast as he possibly can. Moments like the kitchen scene let him really shine. He may be the shortest guy in the room, but he is strong and a force of nature. You don't fuck with this guy. I guess you can say he inverts your expectations. It's this unspoken aspect of the character that made me completely fall in love with him. Also, real quick, He's black, and he's not black because he's from Detroit or Wakanda. He doesn't need to be black, but he is. Not every movie with a minority needs to be a comedy drama about diaspora. This is the kind of role that people of color, like myself, really want, and what we need to see more of, just to be allowed to star in a really interesting movie. In the midst of all the organization's secrecy and high concept complexity, the protagonist is our grounding force. He's intelligent, but he's a little too much of a layman for the incredibly powerful people he interacts with. He paid nine million dollars for it over the cost of the holiday he just forced us on. Where'd you go, Mars? I think you're a little out of your depth. He has a lot of strengths and weaknesses, coming up with crazy ideas like the five truck heist, and eventually learns how to be a successful member of Tenet, sometimes figuring out things before other characters do. He doesn't have a backstory, but that's the life of a CIA operative turned global super spy. Kind of like James Bond. If we're giving 007 a pass, we need to look at the value the protagonist is providing. This is a high concept intellectual exercise of a film, not a character study. John David Washington did exactly what he needed to do. Okay, so with all this in mind, do you remember when I was talking about a single scene that made this movie. Let's revisit that scene, which made such an impact on me. You know, the one that sounds like... This is the last action scene before it's revealed to the protagonist what a temporal pincer is. Before the real meat of the thought experiment of this film begins. And in this scene, the music telegraphs this shift that's about to take place. This movie is about to go off the rails insane and Ludwig Göransson laid the groundwork for us to be prepared for when it does. While Hans Zimmer may be modern film composition as we know it today, Ludwig is constantly proving himself to be the next step. Nolan has always used music as one of the most important drivers in his scenes. Film is a visual and audio medium, and that doesn't just mean sound design, it means music too. Literally the entire reason I was inspired to make this video was from this score and this image. It resonated so much with me that I felt compelled to understand why. Nothing in Tenet has sounded this bombastic, and it kind of feels like it doesn't belong here. This blaring army of synthesizers is being consistently pushed back by the kick drum, like chaos firmly under control. Which is a nice metaphor for the movie. One of them sounds like a literal siren warning the characters and us. This is the last moment of fairly standard action we're gonna get in the film, and Ludwig's soundscape is like a red alert, warning us that we are about to go off the fucking rails. So that's the music, but what's happening plot-wise in my 2020 movie moment? At this point, 
all the protagonist knows is that the fate of the world is at stake. If they don't get this MacGuffin, bad things. Apocalyptically bad. But we don't know exactly why yet. Protagonist plans this crazy four truck highway pin down. It's this whole Chris Nolan ass heist thing. They have to avoid leaving a digital footprint so that the villain won't be able to have people in the future find evidence of it and send the info back in time and Jesus Christ, God, God, this is complicated. Look, all that matters is that they have to do it this way. But just before this heist takes place, we see Cat walking into the Freeport, and we catch this image of a guy wearing a mask in a car, ready to do something. This was a very striking and unsettling image for me. It's an omen of something inhuman about to occur. And then Sador says, Watch everything and tell me every detail. Watch everything, give me all the details. Which is... Sus. What are, you, what are you talking about? So with these two pieces of information, we know that somehow, some way, this is gonna go horribly wrong. This is the second layer of tension. The first being, this is a really dangerous highway stunt, we don't know if you can actually pull it off. But on top of that, we know that the bad guys have a plan. So the plan goes ahead and protagonist hops on the fire truck. These shots convey this momentum so effectively. I do not understand how the cinematography makes me feel this way. Oh wait, I do! Hoyt Van Hoytema is one of my favorite camera artists. Look at what he did in her. This movie rocks! This is so goddamn pretty and beautiful. But maybe the more important and obvious reason I was so fixated by this scene was it's fucking cool. This is so goddamn cool. It's fucking sick, bro. Denzel Washington's son is jumping off a fucking fire truck on a highway chase directed by Christopher Nolan with Ludwig Gorenson's experimental electronic music and Robert Pattinson's on backup. Like, goddamn. Fire trucks are so cool. I'm a boy. I was nine once. Fire trucks are cool! They're big, and they're red, and they make a big noise. They got a ladder on top and hoses that plug into the fire hydrants, and they use hydro beams to defeat fire! They're the coolest truck! And I like that the protagonist gets to climb on the coolest truck to steal the mega secret. The heist energy is cranked well over 9,000, and we still don't even know what the movie's about. In this moment, all these exciting artists came together to have a singular story beat happen with a ton of style, simply for the sake of making us more immersed in this alternate reality. I just found it to be this true movie moment. It makes me feel like I'm about to rob God. And again, John David Washington, seeing him clutch onto this fire truck, his body fully ready to give it his all, it's just really exciting to watch. And it's not like there's no emotion in this movie. By the end of the film, John David Washington has to reckon with this guy that he just met that he's really getting along with, and that he dies along the way, but also finding out that he's gonna hang out with him in the future and have a whole bunch of fun adventures. The real Tenet was literally the friend he made along the way. So yeah, that's it, that's Tenet. It's a film that is paradoxical by nature and it's a real mess to try and follow. But when you take the time to let the pieces fall into place, when you figure out how they fit themselves, it's so thrilling. This was my movie moment of 2020 and probably my film of 2020. Thank you to CJ the X for helping me write this video. Subscribe, hit the bell, and then also give me money on Patreon. Bye, love you.